Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. This is my first time here in this uh, venue and, and in, in Riga Graduate School of Law as well. I'm going to speak relatively slowly. As a typical Finn, I, I speak as fast as I can think. So, uh, the topic is uh, rule of law in European context. And my emphasis is relatively theoretical. It's more legal theory than, than EU law. Uh, I have some uh, uh, cases from the European Court of Justice, but they are just examples. I, I, my, my, my main idea is to clarify why I think that rule of law has also a material element. Uh, and I'm advocating for a so-called thick conception of rule of law, which is not an original idea, it's not my idea only. There are many other legal scholars who have the same opinion as regards rule of law. And in addition to that, since I have defended my dissertation a long time ago under the topic legal certainty, I would also like to claim that there is a similar uh, setting in, in uh, legal certainty in a sense that there is also a material and a formal element in that concept as well. These concepts, legal certainty and rule of law, are closely related. Uh, <coughs> See if I can. Yeah. If I may, I would also like to comment on the previous presentations and especially the panel of the judges and, and the discussion uh, about uh, autonomy of EU law and, and the diversity of constitutional traditions. And uh, I think that the autonomy of EU law applies especially when, for example, Copenhagen criteria are at stake, or this triangle of democracy, human rights and rule of law. This is the value basis of the European Union. You can't accede to the European Union and to become a member state if you, if you do not respect uh, this value basis, which can be related, for example, to Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. I heard yesterday that there are some who think that this is not a triangle, but a trilemma. <laughs> and, and that is a problem, I think, because uh, human rights, democracy and rule of law, they are intertwined. and, and uh, one cannot understand them separately in a way, uh, at least not in the European Union law context. And, and I would also like to emphasize the autonomy of EU law. Uh, this is actually the reason why there have been so many problems. Thank you. Lately because of these rule of law issues. As now I'm referring to Hungary and Poland, of course. Uh, but this uh, diversity diversity of constitutional traditions may come to the fore uh, on minor issues, such as, for example, uh, the discrimination or non-discrimination, principle of non-discrimination based on age, for example. And Thomas Ojanen has probably discussed about the IOS case from Denmark yesterday. Uh, he told me so. I don't know. I, I'm sorry I was not present. But in any case, IOS case is a very good example of this diversity of national uh, constitutional traditions and sometimes they might uh, collide with the uh, principles uh, elaborated by the European Court of Justice in its case law. Now I'm of course referring to Mangol, Tanky, Kykdebeki and so forth uh, and, and those discrimination based on age line of cases. This <clears throat> is 
is any case in this is in any case the the starting point of my presentation that one has to uh, realize that uh, the value basis of of the European Union is not controversial as such. It's it's uh, it's not a novelty. You can find this basic idea of triangle of human rights, democracy, and rule of law from the Copenhagen criteria, for example. And then, I thought that when I retire, I would like to study rule of law. This is something that old men could do. They have spare time, and you know, it's in a relatively abstract level, and, and, and you can you can perhaps entertain yourself with uh, theoretical issues then when you have perhaps more time. But nowadays rule of law has become relatively topical issue. For example, Brexit. I made a mistake and I, I, I promised to write an article about Brexit two years ago. <laughs> and I had to uh, study the politics of the United Kingdom and, and uh, this constitutional peculiarities they had. And during that time I, I was puzzled by the tabloid newspaper Daily Mail when, when they called those judges who decided that parliament must be heard when uh, British government, Prime Minister May, is negotiating about the so-called divorce treaty. And they called enemies of the state, those judges, and, and, and then one might pose a question how independent those judges are. They have been very independent. This is, refers to the Miller case. And uh, I will come back to this issue and, and, and British politics and democracy in relation to rule of law a bit later. But this is to show you that this is a topical issue. And another thing is that I just received a news flash from Finland a few hours ago. And according to this news flash, the, uh, well, leader of the Social Democratic Party, uh, the party who won the parliamentary elections a few days ago, has now announced uh, some questions to other parties and after the answers to those questions uh, the new government will be formed. And one of the questions is what do you think about rule of law? How do you perceive rule of law? And what, what, what importance do you uh, put on, on, on the rule of law issues? Which was a surprise, but a very good question in my opinion. Although this is a topical issue, there are some, especially in Finland and also in Sweden, who think that rule of law means nothing. It is just a rhetorical balloon uh, and one should not refer to rule of law as a legal argument. And I have tried to understand why there are scholars who have this kind of an opinion. And uh, one of the reasons is that they think that uh, the concept of rule of law is so vague that it contains mutually conflicting principles. It might be the case, but... Uh, If we look at the big picture, we have to realize that those uh, scholars are very legal positivistic and, and they, they don't uh, like to, to uh, or they like to separate law and morality from each other in a very strict way. What happened now? 
Um, a good example of those who don't like material and formal aspect of a rule of law and who actually think that rule of law does not mean anything, it, does, it doesn't matter, is uh, Carl Smith, and, and now we are in the 1930s. And uh, well, it's not the best possible era of, of uh, mankind. And in uh, Nazi Germany, the idea was to have a so-called national socialistic rule of law. And uh, it is basically important to, to find out what the Führer is thinking and then obey him. And that is, that is also the law because the Führer represents the people. Now I <laughs> have understood that there are uh, in the same tone certain politics in, 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 in Europe as well who think that, that, that they are representing people, although there's parliament as well. And the problem here is that, that uh, in, the, in the 30s, uh, the Nazis argued that uh, actually Rule of law does not mean anything specific, and that is why it can be used as an argument against anyone. So it's too vague. And uh, they also didn't uh, understand democracy the same way than, for example, the European Union or human rights, as we know. We can't put a certain uh, ethnic minority to open. That that's a problematic thought. So, my argument is that it's even dangerous to think that rule of law does not mean anything. It is just rhetorics. There must be uh, some sort of a reasonable content for this term as well. And it is a cultural and legal term, but it doesn't mean that it is too vague to be interpreted or analyzed. And it's not merely a formal concept. In uh, Britain, Joseph Ross has argued that uh, it's merely a formal concept. Although he has mentioned that the principle of natural justice must be guaranteed, uh, what does this mean? It does not uh, relate to human rights directly. But for example, uh, if, if, if a person is accused uh, to have committed a certain crime, he or she must be heard in front of the court. And this is one of the principle of, uh, principles of natural justice, for example. And, and therefore, uh, I would claim that even Ross has understood that certain material elements must be uh, understood as part of, uh, as an element of, of, of a rule of law. But in Finland, uh, uh, professor of constitutional law, Antero Juranki, uh, uh, he used to be a professor of constitutional law in Turku a few decades ago, uh, at the beginning of this century, outlined the basic tenets of uh, or, or, the, or the the content of rule of law, so that because of fundamental rights, it contains a material aspect as well. Fundamental rights protect the individual from maladministration, and then there is uh, there are elements which are related to uh, separation of powers and. And, and this is all uh, familiar to you, I suppose. And the conclusion here is that uh, I would claim that the, the mainstream in Finland nowadays is that rule of law requires a certain kind of conception of democracy in which the government is subordinate to parliament. And this is important because uh, one has to distinguish the interest of the state and the interest of the majority from one another. And rule of law somehow may also protect those who belong to a minority. And uh, 
rule of law must be separated from a rule by law, which means a rule by government in practice. I can't use. Uh, and what about EU law nowadays? I told you uh, re at the beginning of my speech that uh, in EU law, uh, rule of law has a material contact nowadays, and that is the case. Uh, or many scholars think so. And now I'm trying to show it. And, and, and this discussion uh, revolves around the concept of thick rule of law. And for example, uh, Laurent Pech has written that EU publications tend to illustrate a substantive uh, slash thick rather than formal slash thin understanding of the rule of law in 2013. And uh, Robert Mac, I can't pronounce this, Mac, Mac Corkwedel, uh, has written uh, three years ago that uh, there are certain elements in rule of law, for example, protection of human rights. Uh, and uh, the definition offered in this article of the international rule of law is a thick one and includes the following elements. Von Bogdandi, Antpöller, and Jonadis had, had um, the same kind of an opinion. This general orientation towards a thick concept of rule of law is in principle reaffirmed in the decision to submit Poland to the framework and so forth. Uh, in the field of uh, comparative law, Tamanaha, for example, has also referred to thick uh, concept of, of rule of law. And uh, in, in his recent uh, monograph, Kostatnidides, uh, has uh, written about rule of law and also referred to thick and thin concept of rule of law and criticized this dualism and, and uh, thought that this is a bit old-fashioned way of thinking. And uh, I don't know whether this is old-fashioned or not, but in any case this uh, division of thick and thin concept of rule of law is uh, well known. <coughs> Then uh, the next step is to find out what can we say about rule of law when we uh, analyze the treaties and the case law of the Court of Justice. And this is a very short, short presentation. There's Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. You know this already. There's this triangle of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. And, uh, Article 2 is based at least partly on Article 6, in which uh, human rights are uh, enhanced. And then, of course, there's this charter. And if we go to the case law, Cadi case must be uh, mentioned in this context. Uh, there is this triangle mentioned in uh, paragraphs 303 and 304 and also Article 6. And uh, as regards the competence of the European Court of Justice, one has to remember that charter applies only when there is a question of implementation of EU law. There must be another EU law norm at hand when the charter will become applicable. So this also reflects the division of power between national constitutional courts or supreme courts and the European Court of Justice. Uh, actually, Agnes already pointed out certain cases from the European Court of Justice which are related to uh, rule of law there, and, and here are some more. This uh, Bielowieska forest case, for example, uh, raised some questions whether Poland is truly uh, obeying the obligations they, we all have uh, 
on account of the European Union membership. And uh, this, this was uh, an infringement procedure and, and the concept of rule of law was not mentioned in the text of the case or in the reasoning of the case. Uh, it was about conservation of natural habitats and of white fauna and flora in, 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 in a so, this, this um, Bielowieska forest. So it's not perhaps uh, truly a, a rule of law case. But uh, instead of the uh, Bielofieska forest case, one can mention that Ahmea case and these Portuguese judges cases, rule of law was uh, explicitly referred to and, and discussed. And uh, then uh, uh, Agnes referred to the Elmer case, but uh, it is the same as this Elm case here. Uh, this was very interesting case in a, in a sense that uh, it, it relates to Poland as well. It was a preliminary ruling question from Irish High Court and it concerned the possibility to surrender a crime suspect to Poland despite of the controversial judicial reforms in Poland at that time. And uh, like Ines actually pointed out during this session when there were judges around, um, mutual trust is uh, important to mention in the framework of rule of law nowadays. And uh, this also come to the fore in this LM case. And in that context, one can refer to Araniusi case, uh, Araniusi and Calderaro case, uh, in which the Court of Justice stated that in context with the European arrest warrant, the, uh, the principle of mutual recognition is based on the member states' mutual trust concerning the fact that national legal systems are capable of ensuring the equal and efficient protection of their fundamental rights as recognized at the union level. Yes. And... Uh, <laughs> Judge Lennartz, or President Lennartz, wrote an article in, in, was it Common Market Law Review or European Market Law Review, I, re I don't remember, about this mutual trust a little bit later after, after this case was published. And, and uh, his point was actually that this mutual trust does not mean uh, blind trust. Uh, the, the judges of the European Court of Justice are not blind. They, they don't, uh, they, they have to, analyze whether a certain member state uh, deserves to be trusted in a certain issue. Like, for example, they did in Ennis case, uh, which uh, is about Dublin system and whether uh, 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 a refugee can be uh, returned back to uh, Greece. And that was not the case uh, because uh, uh, those uh, refugees would, no, would not have been treated in Greece in an appropriate, in an appropriate way. And a relatively recent case uh, from December 2018 was this commission versus Poland. And when I came here yesterday, I met uh, the, fi uh, the president of the Finnish Supreme Court in the same aeroplane, and he told me that he is actually traveling to Warsaw, Poland, and, and there are, there's a meeting between uh, the Supreme Court presidents of Europe. And, and they are actually ce celebrating this case. <laughs> I, I don't, well, and, and whether this celebration comes too early, I don't know. But I couldn't help mentioning this. What happened? Well, so I don't repeat this. There's this triangle based on Article 2. Uh, Ponting case. This is perhaps not familiar to you. And how is this related to this, this, this story of mine? How much do I have time, by the way? Um, ten, minutes. ten minutes. Okay. Ponting case. You remember Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in the 80s. Uh, he was a very strong woman and, and, and 
but there was one time when another woman actually irritated her so much that he lost, she lost her temper. And uh, this was the case. Uh, there was a television debate and, and somebody from the audience uh, posed a question whether the sinking of the Arg Arg Argentinian Belgrano cruiser um, was all right, whether, whether the cruiser was actually moving uh, away from uh, the British uh, Navy or whether the cruiser was actually uh, attacking them. And <laughs> the cruiser Belgrano was moving away, sailing away, and yet the British Navy shot it down and it, 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 it sank. Uh, th but that was a secret. And this um, Ponting, Mr. Ponting was uh, an official uh, of the Ministry of Defense, and uh, this was a criminal, criminal uh, proceedings against Mr. Ponting, who leaked this information, which caused uh, uh, political problems to the government. Um, well, now, um, what the court did was to uh, argue that uh, actually this is um, how democracy works. Uh, parliament, members of the parliament, have a right to know what has happened, what the government has done. And the government officials must tell the truth to the members of the parliament if they are asked. So, uh, Mr. Ponting was prosecuted, but uh, there was no sentence. And uh, at the same time, this uh, British court uh, explained the relationship between rule of law and democracy. And the simple idea is that uh, government is subordinate to parliament and not vice versa. And therefore this separation of powers is very important when a rule of law is at stake. Uh, but uh, when this Miller case was handed down uh, two years ago, uh, they did not refer to Ponting case. That was a different story. Um, what is ruled by law? In China, the law is rather a way to use power than a principle limiting the exercise of power and a basis for a legitimacy of power. And, and this kind of rule of by law thinking is uh, dangerous also for us Europeans, especially nowadays when there are, uh, well, various political rows in many member states in which rule of law and rule by law thinking may collide. But that was about China. Uh, and then I have a sort description of Poland and Hungary. I don't know what you have discussed about yesterday, but there are some problems in Poland and, and this is the case law which I'm referring to. Uh, uh, and these problems uh, relate to the independence of the judiciary, as we all know. In Hungary, uh, the Fidesz party uh, decided to close down the Central European University uh, two years ago. Uh, I don't know the special or, or exact content of this case, maybe Agnes can explain it better, but um, the political control must not reach universities or, uh, or judiciary and, and, and that's part of our uh, legal and, and, and cultural heritage here in, in, in Europe, on European Union in any case. And I, well, uh, when I wrote my dissertation, I remember uh, finding out certain uh, articles or, or monographs 
which concerned uh, life in the era of communism here in Eastern Europe. And I don't know whether this is relevant here at all. But the uh, communistic system was not predictable. And that is some sort of a bridge to the next topic, which is the predictability and uh, legal certainty. And this uh, is an example taken by, take, taken from a monograph by Brian Biggs, Language and Legal Determinacy. I don't know whether this is a true case or not, but you can find it in Biggs's book uh, from the year 1995. It's a funny case. An American judge decided to guilt or innocence of traffic violators by a flip of a coin when he could not decide the case on the basis of the testimony. This is not a correct way to behave when you are a judge. If you don't know what to do, then flipping a coin is, is not uh, acceptable. But why? Legal certainty is not predictability in a sense uh, that you can uh, argue uh, from a mathematic uh, point of view that, well, we know the probability exactly and that is enough, but that is not enough. This flipping a coin case is also an example of abuse of power and therefore legal certainty and rule of law are intertwined. Uh, but in EU, EU law and in the case law of the European Court of Justice, legal certainty is very often referred to as a, uh, as a requirement of predictability. For example, in the global standard case, rules of law must be clear, precise and predictable. And in inter uh, ten years ago, rules should be clear and precise and so forth. But still, there can be also material aspects. Uh, my claim has been and is even nowadays that the principle of legal certainty in EU law relates to the principle of non-retroactivity non and the protection of legitimate expectations in particular, but more profoundly it can be related to the conceptual scale for weighing up and balancing between predictability and acceptability, between formal justice and material fairness. And this was the topic which I discussed with Thomas Ojanen today when we had a breakfast. And uh, we, we are both in our 50s and, and we have been professors at University of Helsinki for a long time. And, 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 and we realized that, that, that our thinking is very much similar to one another. I, I mean, he has concentrated on constitutional law and human rights. And I come to the same conclusion uh, by analyzing legal certainty or rule of law. There must be material fairness as well in legal systems. Legal uh, certainty has been studied more recently by Fenwick, Seams and Farabka. And I would like to recommend the, the book, The Sifting Meaning of Legal Certainty in Comparative and Transnational Law. It's very good. This is uh, uh, the conceptual scale from uh, predictability to acceptability, but I don't think that that is relevant now to, to explain more thoroughly. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions on the floor? No questions? What is the dilemma that you wanted to highlight with this conceptual clarification? Is there something that is missing from the EU legal order? It is not elaborated, it is not explored, I mean, the concept? Because as academics, I think that we agree that legal certainty and the, the ban of legislation and, and, and uh, judicial independence are all elements. Yeah. The problem I have tried to discuss is that uh, when I defended my dissertation 2002 about legal certainty, 
and it contained this idea that there are both formal and, and material substantive element. This uh, uh, idea was not accepted. Uh, there, there were many who, who told me that, well, actually, that's not the case. Legal certainty means predictability. Uh, therefore, it's only a formal concept. Then uh, I wrote a monograph uh, about rule of law two years ago in Finnish, outlining rule of law. And uh, I presented this idea of thick conception of rule of law. And the Finnish audience, or many, many colleagues there, thought that, well, that is, that is wrong. There's no such thing as material rule of law, because rule of law does not mean anything. And, and uh, it's too vague as a concept. You can say anything about rule of law, and, and, and therefore it's, uh, it's too vague to be analyzed in a, in a, in a proper way. It's, a, it's mission impossible. But I don't agree. And, and uh, that, that was perhaps my point. The, the dilemma is to make rule of law so vague that it does not mean anything in legal discourse. And it's dangerous to, to, to um, do, the same, do the same trick than uh, this uh, Carl Schmitt in the 30s. Yeah, this is uh, unfortunately German, but I, I, I took it from uh, this Legalität und Legitimität monograph directly. Um, uh, das Wort Rechtsstaat kann so viel Verschiedenes bedeuten, dass wie das Wort Recht selbst und außerdem noch so viel Verschiedenes wie die mit dem Wort Staat angedeuteten Organisationen. Uh, so, uh, rule of law can mean as many things as law itself, so it doesn't mean anything. And that's what I'm actually trying to object. That was the dilemma. Maybe I can uh, make one comment. Uh, since I was uh, for a long time dealing with United Nations and I also participated in the process of negotiations on a uh, declaration by UN General Assembly of high-level meeting of General Assembly on the rule of law at national and international levels, which has adopted uh, during its 67th session uh, in 2012. And in those discussions, EU was so united and has a very strong position that there is really a substantive concept of the rule of law and it, it includes many elements and uh, argued that there should be a com comprehensive approach towards uh, rule of law both at national level, it means good governance, access to justice, equal rights for all, and also at international level that there should be a strong rule-based rule, rule uh, international order, which was which is also very important, for example, for Baltic states, what happened when like, international principles were uh, uh, violated uh, in, in the 40s. So basically it has very many dimensions and uh, there is even a program uh, included in the report by Secretary General of UN, which uh, provides for concrete indicators in many spheres, uh, not only, you, I mean, good governance, for example, but also uh, prevention of conflict, also uh, prevention of impunity against war crimes and crimes against humanity. And uh, there is also mentioning uh, terror, rule of law, and, and fight against terrorism and against corruption. So it has so many substantive elements which actually EU at international level fought for. But yeah. internally, EU is confused about what rule of law means and whether it has any uh, substantive meaning or not. So this, this is a real dilemma. Yeah, that's a very good comment. And, uh, actually, I forgot to mention the work of the Venice Commission here. And they also have uh, defined rule of law so that it contains substantive element. Great.
proposed yeah. to, of, to, the, to this quasi-formal element. It is more understandable uh, and it is easier to differentiate between human rights and rule of law. Because I think that the, this is the problem, that it's very confusing when we use the uh, human rights claim and, and formulate them in, in rule of law claims as well. So that's why I, I really agree with Raz that we should tailor this, this idea of rule of law to these formal principles, just to make a clear difference. Yes, and, and uh, then this is also a question of uh, legal positivism and, uh, on the other hand, um, natural law theories. Uh, Ross, Craig, Tuori and, and many other uh, famous scholars think the same as you, that, that it, it, it's, it's more or less formal. Uh, whereas, for example, Tolkien and, and so-called naturalists, Finnish, Fuller and, and so forth, uh, in Britain, uh, they advocate for a more, uh, well, soft way of understanding rule of law, so that it contains also material elements. And um, that is why I, I, um, uh, I thought that it might uh, add something to this discussion, a theoretical discussion, if I put forward some ideas of so-called thick uh, conception of rule of law and how in the contemporary EU law literature and comparative law literature this thick conception of rule of law has uh, become mainstream in my opinion. So this uh, it seems to be so that uh, Ross and Craig for example they they rely on British legal theory very much on, 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 on the uh, understanding of rule of law, whereas, for example, Pech and, and McCorkwedel and so forth, they rely on case law of the Court of Justice and, and, and treaties and, and the, the, the works of the Venice Commission and so forth, in which you can find these material elements. So uh, I have mixed this theoretical approach to a more practical one. And I have relied on this practical one because I'm interested in case law in, in, in general. So uh, this is a good question, and I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I'm saying that there are various ways. Yeah. As a formal standard, because Poland and Hungary and all these countries are are. Uh, have been violated many times, even this, this former element of the rule of law. And if we agree that, okay, we, we, we accept these this minimum standards that are in this formal element, it is, I think it, it can be shared among the member states and Poland and these countries clearly but violates this very formal uh, standards of the rule of law. But on the other hand, we are not in the 30s anymore. And, and if we uh, rely on this Mitch idea that the formal uh, uh, understanding of rule of law might be enough, might suffice, because it is easier to comprehend and uh, it's e more easy to apply. But nowadays we have Article 2 in which we actually relate rule of law to democracy and uh, human dignity, freedom, equality, and to the value basis of the European Union. And my understanding is that you can't separate rule of law from the context and, and, and uh, think that uh, it is merely formal, because you have to connect human rights and rule of law somehow. And that is why I agree. Yes. I, I fully agree with you, and I'm also a, a proponent of thick. I, I don't think how it is, whether it's possible to even go back to a, a thin conception. And if you stick to a thin conception, then you always have to see it in connection with the other fundamental values. So it doesn't matter so much. And I like to think that there is much more agreement on what rule of law or rule of law as part of the, of the package um, requires. The problem or the challenge for the EU is that Article 2 
is, is I mean, the, the, the lens is adjusted very broadly, right? Yeah. It's very abstract. Right. Yeah. The problem, of course, is what are the concrete obligations on the member states in a concrete, in a given case, based on Article 2? That is the clarity that we miss. And that is why, for instance, the Portuguese judges' case is su su such an important case, because it allows the, the Court of Justice to formulate concrete uh, obligations, because that is what is missing. So I, I think that the, the, the theoretical discussion about thick or thin or separate or together yeah. with is less important at the end of the day yeah. than the concrete obligations uh, in concrete cases. And I think that the, we should not o also overestimate the differences of opinion in different legal systems between yeah. état de droit, rechtsstaat, rule of law. I think at the end of the day, we know what it is all about. It's, it's yeah. government under constitutions, bound, limited government. limited government. It's as simple as that. Yes, I agree with you. That was a very good point, Anna. And in my, in my opinion, uh, that is one of my points here, that one has to separate rule by law from rule of law, and that's the main argument. Yeah. Thank you.